Anybody recognize? Uh, anybody here know how to free fuse? All right, let's see if I can teach you. Lecture, the rest of the lecture will be more fun if you can do this. So I want you to hold up two fingers like so. And I want you to cross your eyes so you see exactly three fingers. Not four, three. <laughs> Who's able to do it? All right, now I want you to do the same thing up here. Right? Cross your eyes so you see exactly three images. Can you get it? It pops out in depth? Anybody else get it? You? No way. Is that because your mother told you not to do it because they get stuck? Um, all right, so what we're going to study today is how she was able to see 3D depth from, um, from this display. How many of you have been to a 3D movie before? Never been to a 3D movie? Oh, I have. Has anybody had trouble seeing 3D in the 3D movie? You can free fuse and you have trouble in a... I've been to vision therapy for a long time, so I can do all this stuff. <laughs> oh, so you get... Yeah. I actually, when I, I thought I was stereo blind for a long time in this field, I was at a meeting uh, many, many, many years ago and um, with a colleague who was showing me, pulled out a bunch of stereo games to show me, and I said, well, do you have a viewer? And he looked at me and he said, you can't free fuse? You call yourself a vision researcher? So he says, puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says, that's all right, kid, you know. I, <laughs> I, there was a time when I couldn't do that either, so um, he told me the story. He was on a plane, and in the front of the fuselage there were... Uh, uh, like two pictures or something or other, and he spent the whole time in the plane just crossing his eyes, trying to get them to fuse. Um, so it'd be like me sticking your head on his body. <laughs> That's really weird. Um, so anyway, he taught himself to do that. And so uh, a little bit later, I was at a meeting and listening to a really boring talk. And there was a guy, actually one of my friends who was talking, and uh, he had a big television monitor next to him. And uh, so I spent most of the talk trying to put his head in the television monitor. And I was able to do it and get control over it. My students at some point turned around and were looking at me and said, what the hell is he doing, right? Because I'm listening to this talk, you know, like <laughs> with my eyes crossed. And um, so I was, at the time, I was running an experiment on binocular vision. It turns out my thresholds drop like by a factor of three once I had good control over my eye movements. Like you, I told that story once to my optometrist. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, oh, I get money to teach people to do that. Lots of money. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> Was there some medical reason, not just because you wanted to see 3D movies? No, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> no, to, um, convergence and sufficiency. Oh, okay. I just couldn't, I couldn't read very well. Uh, it's fairly common. Yeah. Definitely. For some reason, I get graduate students with this problem. I mean, it's terrible. I can't you use them for my own experiments. <laughs> the, um, however, that being the case, there's a long history to... Um, uh, stereopsis. Uh, these devices were invented in the 1800s, uh, stereo viewers. Yeah, I'm sure you all played with these things. You recognize this? What's it called? Oh, uh, um, I don't remember. 
Anybody remember? Go ahead. Viewmaster. Viewmaster. And you get those, you know, little Disney cartoons they would put in there that, that you'd watch. So I should have known I wasn't stereo blind because I could see stereo in the Viewmaster. But I couldn't with random dot stereograms, which I'll, I'll show you a bunch later. Um, so anyway, what they do is they have pairs of pictures uh, that you stick in there and then you look through the viewer and one eye sees one picture, the other eye sees the other picture. Um, Actually, if, if you're interested, they're, they're, you can buy stereo cameras. I had a student once who was, uh, that was his hobby. He had like 25 different stereo cameras and uh, would take the stereo pictures you could use in a device like this. So this is what they had back in the 1800s. So if you were a fashionable middle class person in the 1800s, you would have something like this in your parlor and you have little cards that you could show off to your house guests. And um, actually, if you find these cards now, they're, they're, they're worth something. These are collectible devices. If, some of them are very well made. Here's another way of doing stereo. This is uh, usually if you're in a, uh, well, the way they used to do it in laboratory research. I, some labs still do it. They claim this is a better technique than uh, what I use. but. Uh, so you look here, here are the eyes, you're looking at these two mirrors. Uh, the mirrors are adjusted so you get a reflection off a different mirror and that gives you an image from a monitor. And um, this is called a mirror stereoscope and it's quite common to use these in uh, psychophysics research. Um, anaglyphs are another method. And um, that's these guys. Let's pass these out. Full service shop today. Okay, now the way these things work is, um, so what you do is you make an image, one image in red, and another image in blue. And then you composite them together in the same frame. And what these filters do is that the blue one lets, uh, one wavelength through, the red one lets a different wavelength through, so each guy sees, each eye sees the appropriate uh, image. Let's see if I can come up with an example of these. So here's how it works. The red gets through the blue lens, the blue gets through the red lens, and this is the, the combined image, but uh, in this case your eye is seeing it stereoscopically. Uh, it blocks the blue light. Now, when you go to a 3D movie... Does, how does it block the blue light? Wouldn't it let it through? Um, I'd have to think of it. It's possible I made a mistake, but uh, I based it off this slide. Now, when you go to a 3D movie, they, when I was a kid, they used to use these things. And 3D movies were the hokiest things you could imagine. You know, they'd usually have some gorilla that would, you know, reach out its hand, like right in front of your nose or something like that. And um, you can, if you get on the web and, you know, 3D movies in the 50s, you'll see a whole theater with people with these things on. Um, today, they don't do it that way. They uh, take advantage of light polarization. Um, so the way this works is that uh, uh, light 
are vibrations in the electric and magnetic fields. And they, in incoherent light, like what we have in this room, uh, the orientations of those vibrations are completely at random. However, it is possible uh, to use filters. They're called polarizing filters. Most of your sunglasses have that property. So they only let light through that's oriented in a particular orientation. Now, the reason they're able to do these in motion picture uh, only is because there are very few materials that, there's only one I know of, that reflect light and preserve the polarization, and that's silver. So what do they call the screens in a movie theater? Silver the silver screen. And why do you think they call it the silver screen? Because they're coated in silver. And because they're coated in silver, if you project uh, polarized light onto the silver surface, the reflections will also be polarized. If you tried this on this screen, it wouldn't work because this screen isn't coated in silver. Um, I had a friend once who was giving a colloquium at another university and had polarized stereograms. And so I spent like two hours scouring the university trying to find a big sheet of silver that he could present his uh, displays on. And I actually found one, and then he didn't get to show them after all. So um, anyway, that's why it's called the silver screen. And that's the technique they take advantage of here. And so here's an example of this in, a, in an IMAX. I don't know if you can see it, it's not very bright, but if you look at that guy there, he's not wearing the glasses. Why do you think one, one might not wear the glasses at an IMAX theater? Headaches. Headaches is one. Motion sickness is another. Uh, remember, you're not at the right vantage point. You're not converging at the right spot. You lose a lot of resolution. So I've seen a couple of movies both ways, both in the 3D version and the 2D version. I generally preserve the 2D ones because they, they just have a sharper looking picture. My wife can't stand 3D movies because she comes out dizzy all the time. Um, on our honeymoon, we went to our first IMAX movie. Uh, it was in Toronto and it was in 3D, IMAX in 3D. And it was on a roller coaster. And I lasted about two minutes, and I had to take off the glasses. Otherwise, I would have thrown up on the person in front of me. Uh, my wife took hers off at about the same time. Uh, it's just very provocative. There, there's, I, I may have talked about this before, but uh, the visual system has this default. If your inner ear is telling you one thing, and your vision is telling you something else, uh, the natural response of the body is to throw up. Um, and this has some practical problems. So for example, when uh, the astronauts go in outer space, um, over half of them are incapacitated with motion sickness uh, the first few days of weightlessness. And because their vestibular system's telling you one thing, your vision system's telling you something else, and your body and so there's a lot of research that goes on trying to adapt people here before they go up. Uh, there's a famous training device they use, which is the, has the nickname the Vomit Comet. <laughs> Have you ever heard of this thing? Um, so it's a plane that flies over the Gulf of Mexico in a parabolic arc. And so you spend two minutes thereabouts in zero G and then two minutes in two G. And this just alternates back and forth. And um, many people get motion sick when they're uh, in this. In fact, the, the group I know that goes down there, they have a tradition. They all eat a Big Mac before they uh, uh, get on this thing. Um, but uh, that's why you might not want to wear the glasses. In fact, it's so bad that I was at a NRC meeting, a National Research Council meeting once, where they were. Um, they have a problem with um, pilots. So let's say you fly an F-16. And 
So these guys who fly F-16s, uh, they never get sick, right? They do swirls, they do all these crazy maneuvers that you know would make us scream for mercy, uh, but they're fine with it. But if you put them in a simulator of an F-16, then they get motion sick. And because of that, they, they're grounded for a couple of days after they do these flight simulations. So they have to do the flight simulations for training, um, but then the pilots have to be grounded until their vestibular systems are back in whack. And so what we were doing at this NRC meeting was trying to figure out ways uh, to prevent them from getting sick in the simulator. Uh, how many of you have been to Disney World? You've been on one of those rides where, you know, it's uh, like Star Tours or, uh, um, and did you get sick? Why do you think you didn't get sick? Yeah, so what they do is they shake the, the cabin that you're in randomly. So you get some vestibular input, which is random, and uh, it's not like your vestibular system's saying, I'm just sitting here doing nothing, and your eyes saying, you know, I'm speeding through this cave at 600 miles an hour. Uh, some of the things they do at those parks are amazing, but uh, there's one ride, at, at Universal's the one I like, uh, there's a ride there called Spider-Man, and you've been, done that one. It's sort of a melange to the way that, so in, back in the 50s when Disneyland first opened, uh, everything was mechanical, right? So you'd go through a lake and this mechanical hippopotamus would come up. And then they got into the 3D movie thing, like um, the, uh, the Star Tours thing. And then they got into holographs. And Spider-Man is like, uh, so you go through stages and each one you're sort of a different level of technology so uh, at the end of this thing you're you know running away from a monster on a cart that's heading up to the top of the empire state building and is hurtling down you're in full-blown vr i don't know how they pull this thing off but it it's uh, it it's really good virtual reality and then you know, you're about to fall off the Empire State, well, you do fall off the Empire State Building, and uh, then all of a sudden, Spider-Man comes to the scene, makes a web that catches you, ride comes to a stop, and you go home. You know, wait a second, I, you know, what, what's going on here? I think I rode that one six times or something <laughs> like that, but... Uh, all right, moving on. All right, let's look at this with the glasses. I want you to first look with the... Um, uh, red on the right. What do you see? Uh, maybe the outline of a square, but <laughs> uh, that's about it right now. Let's see what I get from your spot. Okay, put the blue on the right. Might be a little easier to see. What do you see? The square pops out. Square pops out? How many of you see a square pop out? Now you gotta have both eyes to see this. <laughs> now turn your glasses around, what do you see? You see a square hole? Am I on your way? You see the hole when like the red's on the right. Now this type of stereogram, it's called a random dot stereogram, and it, it's interesting. It was invented by a guy at uh, Bell Laboratories named uh, Bela Ulege, uh, who very famous. I guess he was an engineer, not a psychologist, but he, he worked in binocular vision for most of his career. And um, in fact, I told you a story about him when he had those paintings of Lincoln. So Harmon and Yelege, the same guy who did that, also invented these uh, random dot stereograms. 
What makes them interesting is that there are no features to tell you what your eyes should be focused on. So if I look at the scene in 3D, right, uh, one eye sees the tip of your nose, another eye sees the tip of your nose, um, it's easy for this eye to tell what this eye is looking at because it's both cases it's the tip of the nose, but you can't do that for these kinds of things. So how do you know which dot in um, one image matches which dot in the other image. That's a problem we'll talk about uh, next time. Here's another example. So blue on the right. What do you see? See 3D object, now turn the ones around. This might be a little bit harder to fuse. You see a concave object? Yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, you're, um, is it an optometrist who helped you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Did you have this problem as a kid? Yeah, but I didn't do PT until high school. Oh, okay. So it was really messed up. Because huh? um, stereo exhibits a property called a critical period. Mm -hmm. And if you'd gone the first 10 years of your life and never experienced stereo, you wouldn't have been able to learn it no matter how much you paid your optometrist. Um, here's another example. If you look on the web, there are hundreds of these things. A lot of them really hokey. Oh, here. All right, now the next one is an interesting one. Um, uh, not the one I thought was coming up, but um, now that you've experienced this, let's give you another chance to try and free fuse. So that would be this one. So see if you can cross your eyes, see three panels, and raise your hand if you can get it to pop out in depth. Just one of you. That's usually the case. It definitely takes some practice to learn how to do this. Um, here's another example. This one helps because it's got the two dots here. So if you can now fuse these to get exactly three dots, that will help fuse it. Anybody get that to pop out in 3D? Just the one student who's been trained. That's like cheating. Um, when I was your age, I couldn't do this either. But you can teach yourself pretty quickly. An hour of practicing with uh, trying to get control of your virgin's eye movements, and this is pretty easy to do. Now, how many of you have ever seen a book, they call it Magic Eyes? Very popular in Japan. Um, you have. Um, so these stereograms are a little different. Um, this one will be much easier if you're looking at it on your laptop than it will on the screen. And so the idea here is you want to look if it's on your laptop, you want to look behind the laptop. Now sometimes you'll see these for sale in the malls and they'll put them on a, um, they'll put a glass, a sheet of glass in front of it. And the way that's good is that uh, if you look at your reflection in the glass, you're fixated at right, about the right place to see the stereogram. Um, I had a visitor coming many years ago, Jan Kundering, a guy I've talked about many times in this course. And um, so they were staying at our house for a week 
while we were doing some research, and they brought me a couple of these Magic Eyes books as a, as a present because we were hosting them. And uh, so we're sitting around the table, and uh, uh, there were these two Dutch guests and myself and my wife, and the three vision scientists are looking at this, oh, this one's really cool, check this one out, check this one out. And my wife's looking around like she's not seeing a thing. <laughs> And uh, she was absolutely convinced that there was no 3D there. We were just spoofing on her. <laughs> to this day, she, she thinks it's all a hoax. Um, that was before Donald Trump invented that term. But uh. <laughs> Now, here's another interesting kind of uh, stereogram. It takes place because of uh, the fact that different wavelengths of light refract differently. And so um, take a peek at that. Can anybody see the blue region in front or behind the red region? Which one's in front? Red. Anybody else see some depth here? Which one's in front? Which one's in front? You can see it either way. That's why I didn't... Uh, and so the reason why this is happening is because of the way that the light is being refracted. So the, the blue stuff is appearing at a different position on the retina than the red stuff is. Here's another example. This one works better for me. So here I see the red is in front. And I don't get much of an effect in this one. How many see some depth in here? Raise your hand. Which one do you see in front? Right. Do you see depth there? <coughs> I see depth on the one on the right. Which one's in front? Blue. Yeah, these are a bit idiosyncratic. I, I debate every year whether I should show this, because half the class doesn't get it, and the other half see it differently. But uh, it is a kind of uh, stereo. This one's sort of fun. You seem to be well-tuned to here. What do you see here? You see any depth? No. Anybody see like uh, cylindrical shapes? All right, forget I showed you this. <laughs> All right, so enough of the demonstrations. Um, let's define what we mean by disparity. Um, so the basic idea is that what we're trying to understand is each eye sees a slightly different view of the world. And what the brain is able to do is to exploit the differences between each eye's view and use that to drive information about 3D shape. Now the differences between each eye's view is referred to as binocular disparity. Now, just to make it as confusing as possible, uh, I'll give you three different definitions. They're all equivalent. Some are more useful in different contexts than others. So let's start with this one. It's the difference in convergence angle that would be required to fixate two different points. So let's say I look at you, I look at your nose, and my eyes are converged like so. And if I look at your nose, my eyes are converged less. The difference in those convergence angles is the disparity difference between your nose and your nose. That's one way of defining it. So again, if you're looking at point A, alpha, and B, the difference in those angles is the disparity between this point and that point. Now another definition of disparity is the difference between a point's projected location in the image plane for different directions of view. So let's take a peek here. Here we have um, 
the left eye, the right eye, they're looking at this point, and that point is projecting to the same location, namely the fovea, on each eye. The place where you're fixated is what's known as zero disparity. So it's zero disparity relative to the display screen. Now let's say I move the point back, or I move the point forward. Uh, so now the point's in front of the display screen. The projected image of the for the right eye is to the left of the projected image for the left eye. And this is called cross disparity. The farther it goes forward, the more different these two projections become. We can also have uncross disparity, which is this case here, where the point is behind the image plane. And again, the farther away it gets, um, the more different these become. Yeah? I'm having trouble understanding what the, what the line is for, because how, how can you see past? I'm, ex I'm picturing something that is blocking view. So the easiest way to think of it, remember when we talked about uh, perspective? Yeah. It's the idea you're looking through a window. All right, so suppose you're looking through a window at a scene, mm -hmm. right? Think of this line as the window. Okay. So it's where in the window this point mm -hmm. is projecting. Okay. Now, if you're doing a computer display, it would be your computer monitor. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you a bunch of those. If I show you a slide show, like we're doing here, then it's the projection screen. Okay. Any other questions about this? Yeah. Um, no, this is uncrossed because the left eye's view is to the left of the right eye's view. If we go back, cross disparity is when you're in front of the display screen. But are you in front of the display screen? I'm sorry? I, I guess I'm saying you're that, to me, from my perspective, you're that dot in, in this example. Uh, no, this example is just a dot. Okay. And you're not looking at it. I'll make it clearer when I show you an actual stereogram and we can see this in action. Oh, well, here's an example. I'll show you a stereogram right now. Uh, I think this one requires blue on the right. Yeah. All right, can you all see it? All right, now take off your glasses and I want you to look at the stereogram on its own. The blue image is to the left or right of the red image? To the left. To the left. How about um, down here? Is the blue image to the left or the right of the red image? It's on the right. All right, so the, the, the sign of the difference changes if you're really close you get cross disparity, that's this thing. And if you're far away, you have uncrossed disparity, which is that. And somewhere in here, like right here, notice you don't even see any red and blue. So that's zero disparity. Is this a little bit clearer for you? Yeah. OK. And then finally, the most confusing one, uh, it's the difference in visual angle between the optical projections on the two eyes. Now, at the end of the day, you have to measure disparity, you have to be able to measure disparity uh, on the retina because that's where you're actually getting the pattern of stimulation. And in order to do that, you have to make a few assumptions, which I'll go through in a second. Um, so the idea here is that imagine there's some sort of coordinate system on the back of the eye. Be any coordinate system you want. But the idea is that you can identify particular positions uh, on the retina of each eye. And so for example, uh, let's take, if I'm looking at this feature F, 
it's at one position on this eye, and it's at a different position on this eye. So the retinal angle between those positions is what's referred to as binocular disparity. So it's the difference in the coordinate values that a given feature is projecting onto each eye. So here, they have the same coordinate, looks like. Here, they're different coordinates, but they're on the same sign. So here are different coordinates on different sides of the um, optic nerve. Here we have different coordinates, but same size of the optic nerve. And um, that's what we mean by um, disparity. Now, one of the things that people have studied is I really have no idea where this word comes from. It, it, the name of it is a horopter. And what a horopter is, it's the locus of points that all have the same disparity. All right, so if I look at your nose, I'm fixated on your nose, there's zero disparity. Now there's some point in this direction that also has zero disparity, projects to the same point on my eyes. And there's some point over here that has zero disparity. And so the locus of all those points that have the same disparity value is referred to as the horopter. And so here's the horopter is this curved hypothetical surface. And so you imagine these three uh, swimmers are all on the horopter. So that means that all of the, if the um, bodyguard is fixating on Frida, that Susan, so Frida has zero disparity, Susan and Harry will also have zero disparity. But Carol and Lee are in front of the horopter, and so they will have cross disparity. And if there's some other student behind, they would have uncrossed disparity. So that's the idea, all these, so Frida, projects the same coordinate as on this eye. Harry projects here and here, they're at the same coordinate. And Susan projects um, here and there at the same coordinate. So the fact that they're projecting to the same coordinates on each eye is how you define zero disparity using this definition. Now if you're in front of the horopter, you get cross disparity. And if you're behind the horopter, you get uncrossed disparity. It's funny, when I was a student, I told myself, I made a vow to myself, that there were two things I would never study in perception. One of them was color vision. It's a bottomless pit. And I've kept that vow. The other one was binocular vision, which I was forced into by students to investigate, so I, I had to break the vow for this. Uh, but the reason I made that vow is because when you get into this stuff, it can get deadly boring. So I'm trying to spice it up for you as much as I possibly <laughs> can. Um, So again, the angle of disparity for any given point is defined uh, in this context as the retinal coordinates between the optical projections of each eye. Uh, and that, by the way, it turns out to be the same as if you can compare the divergence angles. Yeah? Does the distance between everyone's eyes and their horopter, does that vary based on the person? Um, yes, it does. Uh, it also varies depending on where you're looking. So right now I'm looking at your nose. Uh, well, actually I'm looking at your whole face. But So the horopter is gonna go through your face. Okay. Uh, but if I turned around here and I looked at you, the horopter would now go through your face. Um, so All right. Would be crossed. If you're looking at me, she would be crossed? Or you have to she would be crossed, me? you would be uncrossed. So you don't focus on the crossed or uncrossed? No, where you focus, so, uh, focus isn't the right word, where you converge, mm -hmm. by definition, is zero disparity. So if you were to look at her, does she have the, the horopter too? 
wherever I'm looking, that's where the horopter, okay. that's where the horopter is. Anything in front of it is cross disparity, anything away from it. And the disparity gets greater the farther away you are from the horopter. So in one direction, it gets more and more negative, and the other direction, it gets more and more positive. Any more questions about this before I move on? Okay, now the next thing we want to worry about is who the hell dreamed up this crazy notion? I actually have no idea. I don't, I don't know this particular aspect of history. It goes back to the 18th century. And, um, you know, people had strange kinds of thoughts about vision in those days. And the horopter is one, but it, it, it stuck with us. Um, and originally, it was a theoretical construct. So, um, and there were two researchers, uh, well, three, Veith and Mueller argued that the horopter is a circle uh, that passes through um, the two lenses of each eye. And then we had this other guy, Aguilonius. I think Aguilonius was earlier than Veith Mueller. And he postulated that the horopter is a straight line. So a horopter connects all the points that are the same depth away from you if you're thinking of depth in Cartesian coordinates. On the other hand, if you think about depth in polar coordinates, that's what this one is measuring. And they would get in big fights about this. And somewhere along the line, um, there was a guy named Nonius who came up with a procedure to actually measure the horopter. And this is the device. This is not a particularly good slide. Um, let me just describe it. So suppose what you have is two thin threads, two thin threads. And uh, one eye sees one of the threads, and the other eye in the bottom of the visual field, and the other eye sees the other thread in the top of the visual field. And what your task on this is to do is one of the threads is fixed, and the other one you can move back and forth in depth. And so what the task is, is to adjust the thread that you can control so the two of them just line up with each other. That's also referred to in a different context. That same sort of judgment is called a vernier adjustment. But uh, in this case, it's named after a guy named uh, Nonius, who invented the technique. Now, I have done this in the past. It's really hard. And the reason it's really hard is you're not really looking at anything, right? So I look at your nose, and it's easy for me to keep fixated on your nose. But it's not so easy if one eye is seeing one thread and another eye is seeing another thread, and you're trying to converge to make them align. And what happens is they come align, but then they drift apart because you're changing your convergence. In your case, before you had training, they'd be jumping around like crazy. But even if you have good control over your virgins, to keep that alignment stable is hard to do. It's really hard to do. So they have to run lots of trials, and they do the averages of all the settings. Um, and so when you have it aligned, that's when you say, all right, these points are corresponding points. So here's what you see, and you have to adjust one of these until these come together and, and form an alignment. So here's what's interesting. If you, so here's the Aguilonius horopter, frontal parallel plane. This is the Veith Mueller horopter, which is a circle that passes through the lenses of each eye. Guess what the empirical horopter is? So that's the horopter that you actually measure using the method I just told you about. It's pretty much exactly halfway between the two of them. So the empirical horopter looks something like this. 
Now, I'll tell you next time, I'll tell you about some experiments where you do this. I, I think I've already told you uh, a similar version of this. If you, suppose I take a subject and um, say I sit here and I'm directing you to move back and forth and I'm directing you to move back and forth and I want you to all be at the same depth as he is. So if you do judgments like, or better yet, I'd have you two at the same depth and I'd just have him adjust back and forth so he looks like at the same depth as you. Uh, if you do those adjustments, and I'll describe some experiments that do that a little bit later, it turns out that you actually set it to be curved. All right, so a straight line in the world doesn't look like a straight line. It looks like a curved line and vice versa. That's what we learned in, for the last exam, right? Yeah, we'll learn more of it okay. this time. But this is the basis for it. It's because of the it's because of the shape of the horopter that that is the case. Oh, what do I want to do here? This is going faster than I thought. All right, I'll do this one thing. I'll let you out early, and we'll probably have a short class next time too. Um, All right, consider this stereogram. What does your brain have to do to be able to see this in 3D? One of my neuroscientists, maybe? Yeah? It has to see the different, like, it has to see a disparity between the eyes. Right, and what is disparity defined as? The difference between where on the retina the, the angle is. Okay, now keep in mind here, let's go back a few slides. So here I've identified particular targets in the world, Susan, Frida, and Harry. All right, when I talk about disparity, I mean Where's Susan's projection on one eye versus Susan's projection on the other eye? So there's some identifiable entity that defines what we're, the difference that we're trying to measure. But what's the identifiable entity here? Uh, well, color is defining what's getting into the right eye and what's getting into the left eye. But how do you know what to match in the left eye's image with what to match in the right eye's image? Yeah? The, edge, the edges of the box. Um, well, in principle, but the edge isn't, well, I guess it is defined. Uh, that works in one case, but not, that works in the, where the, squares in front, but it doesn't work when the squares in back. Uh, but that, that's a good guess though. Um, somehow, what the brain has to figure out is which point, like which of the dots in one image is, matches with which of the dots in the other image. And that's what made these random dot stereograms such an amazing discovery. Because it's seemingly, how could the brain do that? If you count the combinatorics, I mean, there, there are thousands of points on here. For any dot in one eye, there are thousands of points in the other eye you could potentially match it with. So how do you find the right matches? Your suggestion about the contour is a good one. So if you have identifiable features, you use them. Uh, but in, in most cases here, you don't have that. So how, how would we go about doing that? So this is a famous discovery invented by a guy at MIT named David Marr, who's one of the founding fathers of computer vision. Uh, Marr was an interesting, he died in his early 30s. He was like a wunderkind uh, when he was around. And he had this odd view that I happen to share, but is not so much anymore in computer vision. And that is that 
uh, people in computer vision can learn stuff by understanding neurophysiology and visual perception. Uh, and so he had this group at MIT where their mantra that, you know, they would do psychophysics experiments, they had neurophysiological labs there, and they would combine all those fields together. Uh, unfortunately, Marr died in his 30s, and that sort of attitude just dissipated. So now um, there's disappointingly little interaction between the uh, machine vision community and the vision science community. There's some. Some of the better um, computer vision guys do worry about psychology, but most of it now is, is more or less applied math. Uh, we have one here. The guy who's taping the course is in the lab of uh, Alish Martinez, uh, who's a great cognitive science, and talking about Alish. Uh, Alish, Alish is one of the few visions, uh, the few computer vision people who actually worries about psychology and, uh, and neuroscience. Uh, but unfortunately, he's a rarity. And anyway, Marr was one of the first people to do that. And so he came up with a way of solving this problem. So here's what you're dealing with. I got a bunch of points here. And I got a bunch of points here. And the way the stereogram is conducted, actually you can make these yourself. You just take a, a pattern of random noise and then go in with Photoshop, select a square, and then just move it over uh, in the other image and you'll, you'll get a stereogram. So if you think about it, right, here you have all these one zeros, one zeros, one zeros. I pull out this square here and I move it to a different position over here. And then you have different random values that get plugged in in that region right there. And now the problem that you have to solve, this is the hard problem, how do I know which cell here corresponds to which cell over there? Now Mars' insight on this was the following. Remember, we talk about solving these problems. Um, so what we're trying to do is take measurements on the eye that tell us something about the world uh, within some reasonable set of constraints. And so it's the constraints that um, are the thing that are the basis for Mars' solution. So here's the idea. Let's limit the world to just four dots. And so here I have one eye, and it's project these are all the different combinations of four dots. So you could have this dot, uh, L1 compared with this dot R1, and that would be the solid black here. Or I could have L1 paired with R2, which would be this one, right? So all of these are possible pairings you might have. So the question is, how do you get the correct pairing? So Mar proposed three rules for doing this. One he called a compatibility constraint. Black dots can only match black dots. And that definitely happens visually. So if you reverse the contrast of one image relative to the other in a random dot stereogram, nobody can fuse anything. Rule number two, uniqueness. A black dot in one image can only have one match in another. And then this is the key one, continuity. Disparity matches should vary smoothly almost everywhere over an image. So the idea here is mostly what we're looking at is smooth surfaces. And whenever you have smooth surfaces, locally the disparities aren't going to vary very much. They're going to be more or less, they'll vary a little bit, but not a lot. You only get big jumps in disparity if you see, say, one object in front of another when you have occlusions. So these are the three rules. So how does he implement these rules? He does it in the following way. So first principle is neurons tuned to matches in the same visual direction inhibit one another. So all these matches here inhibit each other. So suppose there's a neuron that says, I like it when this direction is paired with that direction. 
and there's another neuron that says, I like it when this direction is paired with that direction. This one says, I like it when this direction is paired with that direction. And this one says, I like it when this direction is paired with that direction. All right? Those neurons in Mars system all inhibit one another. So you've got this inhibitory network where these neurons, when they're activated, inhibit the other ones. Now, what would happen if that's all you had? You wouldn't get any stereo because all the neurons would get shut down. So you can't just shut down the neurons. You also have to build them up. And so we know that in neural networks, you have excitation and inhibition. So here's the second rule. Neurons tuned to matches at the same depth excite one another. So we have this one that matches L1 with R1, this one L2 with R2, this one L3 to R3, and this one L4 to R4, and these are all at the same depth. So in Mars system, those neurons excite one another. All right, so you got some neurons along this way, here, here, and here, those are inhibiting each other. You got others here, 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 are exciting one another. This is called a competitive cooperative neural network. Um, they're actually pretty common in engineering nowadays. This, is, I believe, is the first one. I could be wrong on that, but uh, it's one of the first. And it turns out if you do that, um, you end up with these, these matches are the ones that rise to the surface. And that's sometimes called the mar Poggio model of correspondence matching. All right, so the idea is we've got neurons tuned to the same disparity in the same, I'm sorry, neurons tuned to disparities in the same visual direction, different disparities in the same visual direction, they inhibit one another. Neurons tuned to the same disparity in different visual directions excite one another. And you combine those two processes at work, and all of a sudden you take a really complicated stereogram like this thing, and it pops it out. It, it really does a nice job. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an early example of using uh, neural networks um, for uh, vision science applications. Any questions about this? All right, in that case, I think I will leave, uh, let you out early. Uh, we'll probably have a, a, short, uh, a shorter lecture next time, too. I didn't really have enough to, I had more than I can do in one and not really enough to do in two for this section, so you'll get a little extra time as a result. So I uh, will see you on Thursday, and um, we will finish stereo, and then next Tuesday will be the third exam. Oh, can I get back the glasses before you go?